In a world of plastic rectangles, one man. <laughs> this hummingbird sculpture is one of my most well-known pieces. Um, so I thought I would show you a little bit about how I made it, or more specifically, what I had to do after I made it. When you build sculptures this big, you really have to think about not only what they're gonna look like, but also how on earth you're gonna move them around, and then once they get to where they're going, how you're even just gonna set it up. In order to get it from New York to California to Chicago to Texas, we have to put it into a gigantic crate like this one. Another thing that we have to think about is the size of a truck. This sculpture is taller than the inside of a truck, which means that it has to be built in sections. You'll notice that the wings are not on top of the bird. So what we had to do was design it in a way that the wings could be removed and placed onto the sculpture as part of the installation. So we actually have a separate plywood box which has, it's a mini crate inside the crate that has the wings inside. So the installation process is to open up this crate, unbolt the sculpture from the bottom of the crate, slide it out. It takes about six people to lift it because it's so heavy. We walk it over to where it's going, then we have to come back, get this mini crate out, get the wings out of the mini crate, bring them over, get up on a ladder, put the wings in place, and then hopefully it's all good. When we're creating really large sculptures, the best way to do it is with a lot of basic bricks. Um, and that's why a lot of the large models use big chunky rectangles. The problem is then when you get up into the face itself, those chunky rectangles are too chunky to get the kind of subtlety that you need. Um, I want you to really think that this creature is alive or, or has a personality or feelings or something like that. And so that's when we sort of switch up and start using a lot of the funny pieces like round things and slopes and windows and wheels and doors and all that stuff. And so the goal is to try to get that extra level of detail without sort of changing the overall visual effect. And actually this duck is a good example of that where um, we use these rounded and sloped pieces at the end which creates a smoother effect um, and so you lose that sort of studying and stepping. Um, but in the case of this sculpture specifically, I thought it was okay to do that in this one place. But you can imagine if, an, if a look like this was then applied across the entire face, it might not look right. Having a high-res head on a low-res body, it's almost like if you had a 1080p head on a 240 pixel body. And so I think the end result is that sometimes we create something that when you look at it, it seems very simple. And hopefully you look at it and think, well, that's not so complicated, that's actually pretty easy. Sometimes it's actually really hard to make something look really simple. If I were truly modeling something as delicate as a flower petal, to scale, it would be less than one Lego brick thick. That's impossible. So no matter what, I'm going to have to make this sculpture chunkier than it's supposed to be. We create a lot of sculptures that have very thin flower petals, or insect wings, or antenna, or legs. However, making these giant sculptures sturdy enough to be able to withstand the rigors of public display and truck transport um, and weather, we need to make them really, really tough. And so one of the biggest challenges I face in creating these sculptures is balancing that delicate wispiness of nature with the sturdiness that we actually require uh, in these sculptures. Sometimes we'll make sure that a part of the sculpture conveniently passes by another part of the sculpture, just maybe delicately brushing past. You can see on this pansy, for example, that even though this and this look like two separate petals, once you get down to about here on the inside, behind this one, the two petals touch and it's actually really just one structure at that point. You only need one small point of contact between two surfaces for the model to become much, much stronger. I keep about 15 different colors in stock. A lot of people think I might get special colors made or I can get custom stuff from the Lego company, but I can't. And so one of the really interesting things about having a limited palette of colors is that you sort of have to think about if you're modeling something in real life, like a real animal or a model of a building, like I want to try to get it to look as real as possible, but by the same token, I have to put my own interpretation into it, no matter what. 
I did a model of a hotel that's in Bermuda, and when I think about water, I think it's blue. When I think about grass, it's green. And so I started prototyping the colors, but then I thought, well, you know what's nice about the tropics? Everything just pops. You know, if I was taking a photograph of this hotel, I might want the exposure to be a little higher. I might want it to kind of be blown out a bit. And so instead of using gray for the sidewalk, I used white. Instead of using green for the grass, I used a lime green. Instead of using blue for the water, I used a lightish medium blue. And I ended up building the entire model in this cranked up brighter version. Maybe it's not as true to life as the real colors, but it probably looks the way you feel when you're there or the way you imagine it looks. And that to me is much more important than simply getting it to look absolutely mathematically perfect.